I'd like to start by talking about a man in my life who has been a model for, of coherence for the 11 years I've known him. And that's my friendship with my mentor, Dr. Vincent Baycoat. Now, Vince is a professor of theology at Wheaton College where we met. And I really think of him as more of a public intellectual because if you know Vince, you know that his whole career has really been imbued with a spirit of public theology and that he is relentless about applying belief and doctrine to matters of art, culture, politics. Um, and I've learned to do that from him. And we first bonded over a mutual love of rock and roll. And one of the many things Vince has given me an appreciation for is the music of David Bowie. And so when Bowie died early this year, Vince and I were processing his death together. And he shared with me a quote, something Bono had said in tribute to Bowie. And Bono had told media outlets this, that when you heard Bowie, something in you was played by the music. Something in you was played by the music. That is a high compliment to pay anyone's work, not just to musicians. But if you can impact someone like that, that's awesome. And that's what I said to Vince. We're both amateur musicians. And I just looked at him. I said, Vince, how awesome would it be to be able to do that for people? And he looked at me and he said something that really struck me. He said, that would be awesome, but I fear that many Christians don't think they have permission to do so. If there's one thing you've learned during your fellow's year, hopefully it's that you do not need permission to love and impact the world. Um, and that any, any area of vocation, life and vocation are, is a legitimate expression of appreciation for God's creation. Now, me personally, uniquely, my whole life, the way I've been gifted to express that appreciation are through the realms of politics and music. Again, it's been that way my whole life. Growing up, my sister used to always tell me, when you grow up, you'll either probably be in a band or be president. <laughs> One of those is more realistic than the other, although this year, I bet if I ran, I could probably win. <laughs> um, just saying. Um, and I, I, another mentor figure recommended me to the Falls Church Fellows Program when I told him in college that I wanted to live life at the intersection of politics and pop culture. And as a fellow, that's pretty much where I lived. By day, I was doing donor research for one of the most elite and extensive political fundraising networks in the country. And by night, I was writing songs for what would eventually become my Capstone Fellows Project. And my career since then has pretty much been consistent with that trajectory my day job, music at night on the side. And while it's been consistent, I wouldn't necessarily say it's been coherent because I've never believed I've needed permission to impact the world. What I've struggled to believe is that I have the ability to impact the world. As a result, I constantly cordon off my creative gifts from my everyday life. Now, what does that look like? Um, speaking of my day job, I recently had my performance review this week. And what surprised me about it is a complaint that I normally get did not come up. It's a complaint I've gotten on every other review I've ever gotten. And it usually goes something like this. It's that when we are in meetings, he looks like he does not care. He is zoned out. And in my defense, they are meetings. They can only be so interesting. But it's not that I don't care. It's just that when I hear sound, I have this weird deal that I see color. It happens most strongly with music, but even when you're talking to me, the tones of your voice are enough to send color cascading through my mind's eye. And if we are sitting there in a meeting and you are tapping your pen on the desk, my brain will pick up on the rhythm and will start building a beat, and then it will start building a bass line, and then a guitar part, and then a vocal melody, and before long, I've got a whole radio station going in my head. <laughs> Left unchecked, that's just how my raw creative impulse expresses itself. And what I used to do is sit there and go, well, I'm at work, I'll deal with that later. But really, even if I dealt with it later, later is still too late because I missed that opportunity to bring that creative impulse into my present moment, into the staff meeting. Um, and so what I've constantly had to be challenged to do by people like Kate, by Morna, by my colleagues and peers at IFWE is to figure out you know, that being a good steward of my, of my vocation and my creativity is applying that to every area of my life. I mean, I can't imagine how that conversation with Jesus is going to go when I get to heaven and he's on judgment day. He's like, show me what you did with your creativity. I can't wait to see what you did with it. And I'm going to go, well, you know, Jesus, I had a day job. I had bills to pay. I had to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And 
You know, I just imagine him going, yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And I gave you 8, 10, 12 hours a day to be creative. And the truth is, he didn't give us 8 hours. He gave us 24. And it's not just in our day jobs or in our, you know, side projects, but really every minute of every day, every decision we make, every interaction we have is an opportunity to express our creativity. Now, you may be sitting there and think that what you're doing is not typically associated with creativity, that the job you're working at is not something that the world or the church necessarily recognizes as being a creative endeavor. And I just want to give you a word of encouragement and a word of caution in that. And that scripture emphatically infer, uh, says that that is not true. We are all creative. Why is that? Because the very first thing we see God do is create in Genesis. And then it says, he says, let us make man in our image. And as the result of being made in his image, we reflect his creativity and we all reflect that differently. And some of us reflect that in ways that the world and the church just simply haven't learned to recognize as being creative. But just because we don't recognize your gift does not mean you are not gifted. Um, and I would encourage you to not wait for that recognition because as any creative type, any artist will tell you that if you wait for permission, if you wait for validation, you will probably never get started. So how have I learned to get started and start well? Um, what does that look like um, in my day job, for example? Well, Morna has told multiple people about this weird deal of mine where I see color, in addition to Kate. And I had a supervisor at IFWE working at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. I'm very fortunate to work with supervisors and colleagues who are constantly pushing me to express my creativity at work. And I had a supervisor who put me on a video project. I'm about to show you that video. And she put me on that team because Morna told her about my impulse to sort of coordinate all the musical elements of a song. And she said, well, what if you could coordinate all the elements of a video? What if we could sort of channel that energy into that? And that terrified me because I'd never made a video before. I'd never written a script, never written a log line, never worked with a production company. Still couldn't use a camera to save my life. But she looked at me and she handed me $25,000 and said, here, go make a video. I said, okay, it's your funeral, but I'll do it. Um, I didn't quite say that, but I was nervous. And thankfully, you know, it was, we, I was part of a creative team. It was a team effort. I was working with some people who were very talented and skilled at making videos. And the great thing about working with people who are more talented than you are is that you get more talented by working with them. Um, and we worked with a great team out of Colorado. They go by the name of Coldwater Media. And when we expressed our creative vision for this video to them, they immediately said, we want to go to Portland, and we want to shoot this video there. It's going to be beautiful. I said, that's great. That's what we want. We want it to look beautiful. But, you know, Portland's this hip, creative city. They've got a lot of awesome people doing there, doing awesome things. And so, you know, I sat down with Jim and Mark, the guys who were shooting our video, and I said, I just want to make sure that we're capturing Christians from all walks of life and all positions on the flowchart. Um, you know, we really want all Christians in all endeavors to really see their life and their work in this video and feel that what they're doing is imbued with dignity and creativity. And uh, as we show the video, I think it's getting queued up. Um, we're good to go. Um, I hope this video gets the wheels turning in that way. If you want to talk through that, um, uh, if we has a booth in the back, I'll be there all day. Just come and talk to me, and hopefully this video sort of gets the wheels turning. Our lives are not divided into two halves, with one part being sacred and another part secular. Worship is not reserved only for Sunday morning, but for Monday morning as well. Every time we get out of bed and ready ourselves for the day, every time we labor at a task, no matter how insignificant it may seem, every moment is a gift. Every moment belongs to the one who gave us that moment. There is a way that leads a man to flourish. 
it is freedom. The freedom to discover his true potential, to keep the fruits of his labor, to find fulfillment in his work. These freedoms are the right of every person because they come woven into the God-given dignity of every person. Where they exist, societies and people flourish. Where they are absent, there is only poverty. These freedoms must be championed for this is God's design for us, for the good of all he has created.